Honorable Senators, I'm proud to rise today as a Senator of British Columbia and as a sponsor of Bill C-48, the Oil Tanker Moratorium Act. Honorable Senator, c'est avec fierté que je me lève Honorable Senators, I am proud to rise today as a Senator of British Columbia and as a sponsor of Bill C-48, the Oil Tanker Moratorium Act. It is about our environment. C-48 is an important piece of environmental legislation meant to protect British Columbia's waters. To accomplish this, the bill will enshrine a long-standing crude oil tanker moratorium on the pristine northern coast of my home province, entrench environmental measures that are already long in practice, and implement measures to mitigate the risk and potential scale of oil spills in a very special eco ecosystem. On the one hand, Bill C-48 is an affirmation of our collective responsibility as stewards of British Columbia's ecologically rich and relatively untouched coastal environment and its kelp, forest, salmon runs, resident orcas, and kermod bears. On the other hand, <coughs> Bill C-48 also recognizes the e economic imperative of small communities of coastal British Columbia, many of which have no road access. <coughs> who depend on the marine shipment of goods, including petroleum products necessary to heat homes and run businesses. For that reason, the provisions of this bill will also ensure that these communities are able to function after the moratorium is put in place. To illustrate this balance, I would like to generally describe what this bill does. The Oil Tanker Moratorium Act will prohibit oil, oil tankers carrying more than 12,500 metric tons of crude and persistent oils as cargo from stopping, loading, or unloading at ports or marine installations in northern British Columbia. Les navires transportant une cargaison de moins de deux. Ships carrying a cargo of less than 12,500 metric tons of crude or persistent oils will be able to go to northern communities that depend on these shipments to obtain furnace oil and other products. The moratorium area extends from the Canada-U.S. border in the north to the point on British Columbia's mainland that is across from the northern tip of Vancouver Island. The area also includes an area of Haidagwe. This bill is a key element of the Government of Canada's Ocean Protection Plan. The Ocean Protection Plan is a Canadian strategy to demonstrate world leadership in ensuring marine safety, protecting coastlines, and ensuring clean water while providing economic opportunities for Canadians. Let me repeat that this bill serves to complement the existing voluntary tanker exclusion zone. La zone d'exclusion volontaire fait un... The voluntary tanker exclusion zone has ensured that since 1995, tankers that have a full shipment serving the Trans-Alaska Pipeline have to go west of the area targeted by the moratorium, hundreds of kilometers west of Haida Gwai. Proposals are also consistent with the 1972 federal government policy decision to impose a moratorium on crude oil tanker traffic and provide additional protection for BC's northern coastline around Dixon Entrance, Haycut Strait, and Queen Charlotte Sound. In other words, Bill C-48 will entrench and unify these other older policies and our laws so that anyone entering our waters can understand them. This is a key element of the government of Canada's Ocean Protection Plan. Canada's strategy to demonstrate world leadership in ensuring marine safety, protecting coastlines and ensuring clean water while providing economic opportunities for Canadians. In order to ensure compliance with these measures, Bill C-48 also proposes strict penalties for its contravention. Those who violate the moratorium by carrying more than 12,500 metric tons of persistent oil or an oil that persists in the environment as, as cargo within the, the zone could be fined up to $5 million. Honorable Senators, let me now address to you some of the specific elements of the bill. These restrictions apply to crude oil or persistent oils, which are known for being the heaviest, and as their name indicates, they are the ones that persist the longest after a spell. The oils listed in the bill were identified using an internationally recognized method used by the International Oil Pollution Comp Compensation Funds. 
This test categorized each oil type according to their boiling point range, an internationally recognized measure which will be familiar to people working in the shipping industry. These oils which will be banned include partially upgraded bitumen, synthetic crude oil, slack wax, pitch, and bunker sea fuel. Contrairement aux produits pétroliers plus légers, unlike lighter oil products such as gas or fuel for planes, which finally evaporate or decompose in the sea with the help of microbes, the heaviest parts of heaviest of the heavy hydrocarbons persist in the environment for several years. They float, they disperse, they sink to the bottom of the body of water or wash up on shore. The heaviest parts of these oils cannot evaporate or disintegrate. That said, the moratorium bill does not represent a total ban. These fuels will be allowed to be shipped in quantities below 12,500 metric tons to resupply the coastal communities in the moratorium area that depend upon these ship shipments. To better help these coastal communities, silver, non-persistent oils or oils that dissipate more quickly through evaporation, such as gasoline, light diesel oil, and kerosene were also exempted from the ban. Honorable Senators, there is a very important reason that these particular oils have been chosen for the moratorium. We all remember the Exxon Valdez oil spill in Alaska in 1989, with its heartbreaking and unforgettable scenes of 12,000 1,200 miles of shoreline coated in thick, black, persistent oil. The damage this spill caused was caused catastrophic. According to the Exxon Valdez Oil Spill Trustee Council, outright deaths from the spill included approximately 250,000 seabirds, 2,800 sea otters, 300 harbor seals, 250 bald eagles, and up to 22 orcas and unimaginable billions of salmon and herring eggs. Even after a decade, when the oil seemed to have disappeared, tests on ducks and sea otters showed exposure to hydrocarbons, the chemical compounds contained in crude oil. Even today, the estimated amount of remaining crude oil remains in thousands of gallons of oil. This is not surprising when one considers that the industry star standard for an oil spill response is only 10% cleanup of the oil. Further, in the case of raw, unrefined bitumen, a diluent is used to help it flow. This diluent evaporates quickly, but poses dangers to first responders to the spill, who would be exposed to toxic fumes. Sheila Mackelsam, MP in the other place, spoke eloquently about the slow response times for oil spills. In her region on the southeastern coast of Vancouver Island, in the event of an oil spill, the corporate entity responsible has up to 72 hours to get the spill with booms. In her remarks, Ms. Malcolmson also pointed out many facts to support the need for an oil tanker moratorium. First, shipping oil is a dangerous thing to do, especially through the rough waters of the coast of British Columbia. There are swift currents and tides. Rough waters contribute to the risk of a spill and makes cleanup of a spill, uh, spill all the more difficult. The Royal Society of Canada, Polaris, and the National Academics of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine all agree that it is not clear with a spill in marine waters how long bitumen will float, especially with rough water and sediment. Honorable Senators, much is at stake. The damage from oil spills has lasting effects. For example, spilled oil could contaminate shellfish beds and consequently the animals that eat the shellfish. The damage doesn't stop there. An oil spill affects First Nation communities whose culture and economy depend on a healthy, pristine ocean. While preventing oil spills is clearly the best approach to environmental protection in the event of a spill, quick action is imperative. In the remote north coast of British Columbia, the area to be protected C48, uh, by C48, there is simply not the capacity to respond quickly in the event of a potential oil spill. This is why Bill C48 is so important. It mitigates the risks of spills in one of our ecosystems and along one of the most fragile coasts in Canada. 
by maintaining tankers with a full hold at a distance of 130 kilometers from shore. This zone was determined by calculating the worst scenario possible with a tanker that has a full hold and the time required for help to arrive. Always be able to respond to a crisis and save precious heritage. Honorable Senators, I would like to stress exactly what we are protecting when we put a moratorium in place. In committee proceedings in the other place, they heard from a variety of witnesses who spoke at length about the animals and the people of this remarkable ecosystem. For example, Misty McDuff, a biologist and a pro program director with Rain Coast Conservation Foundation's Wild, Wild Salmon Program, captured the precious natural value of this area. She told the, the committee the following, and I quote, British Columbia's north and central coast, along with Haida Gwaii, comprise a unique environment that is increasingly uncommon, not just in Canada, but in the world. It is where lush forests and granite buttresses greet the sea, where grizzlies dig for clams in the sight of the open Pacific, where wolves swim to distant islands in pursuit of seals, where the ethereal calls of killer whales are used to pursue salmon migrating thousands of kilometers to freshwater rivers of a forest, and where the summer sun sets on the blows of feeding humpback whales that are surrounded by thousands of shearwaters, auklets, and gulls, all in the pursuit of tiny fish that spawn on a sandy shore or on a giant kelps that buffer the fragile coast shoreline." End of quote. This is what C-48 is trying to save when it takes steps to prevent catastrophic oil spills in the area. These spills would severely damage this incredibly productive ecosystem and many of the creatures Canadians not only value, also see an ionic emblems of Canada's wilderness and indeed as part of our national identity. In addition to safeguarding the food chain, a benefit of the moratorium bill that may not be immediately obvious is the limit on underwater noise from large ships, which can significantly disturb the life of marine mammals. These waters are a fragile ecosystem for some of the most majestic mammals, including the resident killer whale population, an endangered species that is now reduced to under 75 remaining whales in the area. Killer whales have in fact been endangered since the 1980s with no sign of recovery on the horizon, and acoustic disturbances from vessel noise is a key threat to their recovery. The whole social network of whales relies on their ability to communicate back and forth underwater noise interferes with their ability to hunt, navigate, and call out to one another. It is for this reason that that noise produced by vessels contributes the slowing of reproduction. Us humans have allowed this majestic species to become endangered. I, however, truly believe humans and whales can share the ocean. It is our job to protect this species for one reason alone, because we cherish them. Simply put, the ocean is full of life and is our sustenance. Thus, it is our duty to protect species that humans have endangered. In British Columbia, wild salmon are an ionic species. The waters of British Columbia's north coast are a significant salmon migration route, with millions of salmon coming from the more than 650 streams and rivers along the coast. The impacts of a single oil spill would be devastating. We enjoy eating this delicious and nutri nutritious salmon. BC salmon have helped make and sustain the temperate rainforest. Salmon su support First Nation communities, coastal communities, and are an integral part of our West Coast economy. Salmon is British Columbian food. Salmon also supports a booming fishing indu industry in British Columbia. Commercial fishery on the North Coast catches over a hundred million dollars worth of fish annually. Over 2,500 residents along BC's North Coast work in the fishery and the processing industry employs thousands more. In addition to their economic importance, salmon is integral to the cultures of native peoples of the Pacific Northwest. For the indigenous people of this area, salmon is both an essential food and a strong spiritual symbol that is central to their traditions and cultures. The West Coast wilderness tourism industry is now estimated to be worth over $782 million annually, employing some 26,000 people full-time and roughly 40,000 people in total. 
The beauty of this coastal region and the abundance of salmon have made it a world-renowned destination for ecotourism, creating jobs and opportunities for economic growth. The shoreline is dotted with sports fishing lodges as enthusiasts flock to experience the natural marine environment and take part in the world's famous fishery. This legislated crude oil tanker ban will help protect the temperate rainforest and marine conservation parks. These two protected areas have incredible biological diversity and should be protected. They contain many species of concern like ionic killer, killer whales, grizzly bears, bald eagles, and Pacific salmon. Honorable Senators, we cannot simply afford to lose them. Honorable Senators, I say to you that this amazing heritage that we Canadians have, we must protect for our children, our grandchildren, and our great-grandchildren. C48 protects these ecosystems in a way that will not interfere with, with resupply activities which are so important for communities and industry along the coast. Once in force, the moratorium will prohibit oil tankers from entering or departing ports and marine installations in northern BC. It will also prohibit transfers to ensure large tankers don't offload products to a smaller fuel barges, making multiple trips to ports. By finding the right balance between environmental protection and community and industry resupply, the government will ensure that shipping companies continue to employ workers from these communities. These jobs are important to individuals working on these ships and the economies of their communities and beyond. However, while community and industry resupply would be allowed to continue, tanker activity would be strictly limited. Large tankers carrying crude oil or persistent oils in quantities over 12,500 metric tons would not be allowed to do business in the moratorium's area. These strong measures reflect the views of many indigenous people who helped shape Bill C-48 and who continue to act as the stewards of the lands and waters of BC's northern coast and of the wildlife that relies on these generous and sensitive habitats for survival. In addition to acting as stewards of this natural world, many indigenous individuals and communities rely on the waterways covered by the proposed moratorium for their livelihood, food security, transportation, and cultural lives. The proposed moratorium demonstrates that a clean environment and a strong economy are mutually compatible. It is an example of sustainable development at its best. Honorable Senators, I would again emphasize the special value of my province's northern coast. This factor should be at the heart of our deliberations on C-48. Those persons most, most passionate and eloquent on the topic are those who, who live sustainably as part of this environment. And, and I would again quote committee proceedings in the other place of Mr. Modestus Nobles, interim chair of Friends of Wild Salmon, said the following, and I quote, for those of us who live on the North Coast, it is an extremely important place. We rely heavily on the resources within the region for economic, recreational, and personal use. We have for years feared an oil spill and the repercussions of that in terms of how our lives would fold out. I don't know how to equate for you the value that exists there for us. We have lived on this, that piece of land for a long time. Many of my neighbors are from First Nations who have been there for centuries. We all rely upon the ocean there. We all rely upon the resources. Those resources are, to us, more important than the other industries that have been brought to us as economies. The economy we wish to see in that region is that of fish, of forestry, and of an ocean that we can rely upon for tourism for generations to come. Honorable Senators, I find no better way to end than with that quote. And I ask you, I know we have a lot of work to do, but I humbly ask you to consider this bill and have this bill beco become law before the summer, as it's important for, in my, for my province in British Columbia. Very Thank good. you very much. Chappie, you'll take a question. Yes. Senator to catch up. Uh, uh, Senator Jaffer, how many tankers of the prohibited size, 12,500, would go by the northern coast every day? Senator, that's a very good question, and I can't give you that answer because I don't know. Because there, as you know, there is an, uh, 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 
uh, voluntary exclusion zones. So there, I have no idea of how many tankers. They don't go by this coast, in fact, because there's an exclusion zone. And what exists in, in, in practice at the moment is being brought in as law. So I don't think that any tankers go close to the area that I am speaking of. But the minister will be at committee, and I know he will be able to better answer that question. That's a question then. Uh, how many tanker accidents uh, have there been uh, off the northern coast uh, that this bill uh, applies to over the last 30 years? That's something I'm very happy to say there haven't been, and I hope there won't be because we know what happened with Exxon Valdez. People in that region are still paying a price and we are being proactive in preventing tanker accidents to preserve our environment. Senator Kaczak. Is there uh, one more question. Is there any plans to prohibit uh, tanker traffic on the eastern coast? As, you know, uh, 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 any, no, say Nova Scotia or any of the maritime provinces? Senator Jaffer. Again, I said to you, Senator, the minister will be at committee and we'll, we can ask him that question from, but my study from of this bill, I understand there are no plans to prohibit tanker traffic on the East Coast. Senator Black, Alberta, a question? If the senator would take a question. Following up on my colleague, Senator Katchuk, Senator Jaffer, could you confirm my understanding that if this bill should pass and if there should be a moratorium as is proposed in the legislation, that it would apply just from Port Hardy north, therefore the Port of Vancouver is not captured by this. And of course it would not apply, as Senator Satchuk has referred, to either Atlantic Canada or the St. Lawrence River. So this would be the only moratorium on oil in Canada. Can you confirm that? Yes. Thank you. Senator Black, Alberta. We'll also confirm, Senator Jaffer, that this would be the only moratorium on the shipping on the high seas of oil in the world. I don't know. Thank you. 